Good to see you again, Sophia. And uh, so you heard SBL presenting on Hebrew phrenology, right? Which is your your thing. Yes, Sonic phrenology. phrenology. Sorry, sorry. I always like to I, clarify. That subset yes. of phrenology. Yes, right? yes. Uh, so first of all, I mean, I guess you can tell the uninitiated what is prosodic phrenology, and then what particularly are you doing within that that world in Hebrew? So prosodic phrenology is a dimension of language that. It's the post-lexical dimension, the super-segmental dimension of language that, um, that shapes and organizes what we say and how we say it. Um, and so it's the, the features, the phonetic, phonetic features of intonation and stress and segmentation. Um, those are primary features of how we organize our speech and so can you give an example in English you know what it like how do we organize our how do we use prosody to organize speech okay so roses are red roses are red violets are blue so the first one you knew that I was just telling you that roses are red right roses are red violets are blue Roses are red. You're waiting for something more, right? Right. right. Um, so that's just a little snippet of the the features that we use to to cue the listener um, to what we're doing with our speech, what we want to do with our speech, what's connected, what's disconnected, what's um, yeah. Just I mean. There's just so much there because a prosodic system, every dimension of language kind of converges in the prosodic system. Mm. Discourse, pragmatics, yeah. phonology, syntax, yeah. everything. So, and so, you know, in the first case, you know, when you, when you, when you raise roses are red, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. it is, uh, we expect more. Right. Um, and so that's like, you know, obviously you work in Hebrew, mm -hmm. right? So in English, it's very, like we have these like very strong intuitions yes. that are right. like deeply embedded that people cannot describe. Like your average person, you know, right, it's like, right. oh, it's, that's just what we do. You know, it's, it's the like, fish I in the water. It, and I, yeah, exactly. How's the water? Fish in the yeah. water. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So we come to Hebrew and how, how is that, uh, how can we see that? Because, you know, for us, again, it's just like there. Um, especially in a language like Hebrew, where we, we, you know, we have some indications of how they spoke it, but how do we know, you know, what, like, roses are red versus roses are red? Yeah. Like, how, how do we tell that difference in Hebrew, or can we? So I'm really at the beginning stages of, of like, because you want the the meat, like, let's, like, <laughs> yeah, like give me the takeaway, give, take me, the give me the system, give me so I can right. figure out all the meaning. So, <laughs> so I, I'm really at the the point in my research in trying to argue that this is a prosodic this is a representation of a prosodic system it's a representation of um meaning the accents the accents that's right the graphemes right the accentual graphemes that the masoretes put in with the consonantal text along with the vocalic system those two notations were part of their reading tradition that they said you can't have one without the other right if you're going to say this, recite this, if you're going to speak this um, in our liturgical setting, you have to have, they have to have both. And so um, I'm at the point where I'm trying to, to argue that, that um, first of all, we should see the features of the system as an integrated system. So one of the things that we do is we say um, the melody of the accents is actually music. Um, and so which isn't quite right because practitioners of the of cantillation traditions, let's say extant cantillation traditions, that have instantiations of the signs, um, they they know that it's not music. This is not like mm. a melody of a song that you just <laughs> you know just right, right. It, this this is a part of uh, it's it's connected to the words and you can't it's connected to the syllable structure. I mean, like you can't separate those two things. So it's, it's not music and, um, and uh, even 
people who, who, who are reciting in liturgical settings understand that they're reading, they're, they're, right, they're giving right. an oral performance, they're not singing. Um, so the, 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 the words that we use in English to kind of describe what's happening in these liturgical settings do us a disservice, I think, in terms of how we understand the system. So mm -hmm. um, one of the things I'm trying to say is that um, this isn't music and it's, it's melody. Okay, we understand the melodies. So, so, but if we, if we take all the features that we know these, these graphemes to, to represent and their functions, if we take them together and don't say, well, um, they were pausal representations of, of, of pause, just different degrees of pause. And then over time, the music was kind of added and it's become kind of a musical system as well. Um, and then, of course, there's stress, and so all of these kind of um, features were de developed over time. And um, it, but if we if we take it as this is an integrated system, not something that kind of developed piecemeal, yeah. um, then we can we can see that it actually these graphemes um, represent all of the features of phonetic features of a, of a prosodic system, um, and. And the way we describe how they function in the text, how they interact with the syntax, um, how uh, we understand that there's, there's actually meaning, like if you take out the accents or if you don't phrase it the right way or if that, that you're, 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 um, you're doing a disservice to the oral um, recitation of, of the text, um, then we actually can see that this is this is a prosodic, this is a representation of a prosodic system, and and what I've tried to do in this paper right. uh, for for this conference. Um, so in my doctoral uh, um, thesis, I I looked at one of the um, relative clauses uh, because you know we know that. Um, Relative clauses, uh, they're restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses, and... Um, so can you give an example of the, the difference between the two? Uh, so... Prosodically... Uh, okay, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> well, okay, okay, so Let me the, the, the man, like, you know... Yeah. The man who ate the last piece of pizza uh, got kicked out. Okay. Right? Or the man who ate the last piece of pizza got kicked out. Right. So in those two instances, yeah. right, we have two different kinds of, you can hear yeah. in the, in yeah. the prosody, the different mm -hmm. kinds mm -hmm. of, uh, I mean, um, really interpretive signals, right, to whether restrict the relative clause or make it non-restrictive. Yeah. So it, the non-restrictive, the man, and I'm going to tell you something about him, that's, right. that, you know, is not, is not helping you to identify the man, right. Right. right, the man who ate the last piece of pizza. Right, so that would be the non-restrictive. There, so there's your there's your example. Beautiful. So. Thank you. So, <laughs> so you're talking about Hebrew. So um, first of all, we modern or theorists have uh, proposed and expected that non-restrictive uh, relative clauses will have a non-restrictive prosodic format, and there's a, there's kind of a strict dichotomy, uh, and and that restrictive relative clauses will have a exclusively restrictive prosodic format. And um, so this that's is true, what, like across. Yeah, I mean that's all... that's kind of just what we expect. That, okay, right. That, that's that's something that um, that we expect to happen, and so. And, and it's easier when you're doing just a simple sentence, kind right. of just pulled out of discourse and conversation yeah. and yeah. all of that. Um, and, and, and you can find those clear patterns right. um, of disinter prosodic disintegration for non-restrictives and integration for restrictives. But um, Berkner 2012 uh, did, a, did a study on a Ger German corpus um, looking at uh, relative a spoken, clauses, spoken, okay. yes, corpus. Okay. Corp a spoken discourse. Um, um, I think it was on some like reality TV show or something, and, okay. and they just analyzed the relative clauses um, in the conversation. And what she, um, well, first of all, she identified six prosodic, six prosodic formats for relative clauses. Right. So um, already so, more complex than the two. Right, right. Right. And then she um, found that these these six formats were heterogeneous in their mm. makeup of restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses. So that's, that's totally just... <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, um, 
whereas you would expect more restrictives to, to be in inter integrated prosthetic formats. Right. Yes, that's true. And more non-restrictives to be in disintegrated formats. But that's true. But you also find a mixing of, of these prosthetic formats. Um, and even in the, the three, for example, um, um, disintegrated formats, you have some with pause, some without pause, hmm. um, some where the nuclear accent is on the, the head noun, um, some where it isn't, some where there's a nuclear accent in the, in the relative clause um, hmm. portion. And so all of this complexity, right? Um, and when I did, I, for, let's see, I did, uh, in my MA, I did an analysis of um, all of the a share relative clauses, and I was working kind of under a different m model. I was looking at a at the melodic structure of a particular Ashkenazi um, cantillation tradition, and found like found this heterogeneous complexity complexity there. And yeah, I was, yeah. And and I found that before I found Berkner. the Berkner. <laughs> but when I found Berkner, I was just like, wow, that's that's pretty cool. And then I did a in my doctoral um, thesis, I did a, a smaller study kind of fine-tuning the, the prosthetic um, formats for Tiberian Hebrew. Um, and, and then in this, for this paper, I've, I've since refined the prosthetic formats uh, further, um, but I was able to identify um, six, no, through five of the six prosthetic formats. Um, so basically from Berkner, you yes, mapped them onto Hebrew. Yes, yeah, wow. yeah. And, um, and of course, found a similar heterogeneity uh, in in the the semantics of of the restrictive or of the relative clauses. And um, yeah, and uh, yeah, we could go more into yeah, kind yeah. Of the so I, I, guess, I guess one one you know maybe like final question I yeah. have is like what do we learn from this? Like, like, is it, like, can we start to make predictions? Like, what, I mean, obviously, like, I mean, I think once you get deep into, honestly, any linguistic issue, you realize, like, oh, it's complex. It's more yeah. complex than yeah. I thought, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? But, but there's, um, I, I always feel like there's hope of finding some sort of, like, logical pattern. Not, not that, not that you can always do that. Is there, yeah, I mean, what what is the what is the outcome of of finding the heterogeneity? Is, are there tendencies? Are there is it just like a total hodgepodge that we can't predict, um, or is there some maybe even something like that you know we might not know yet that might allow us to um, map you know the like relative clause structure to the the prosody, or or like I said, maybe they just don't. So what's the <laughs> conclusion? You know. Yeah. So. Um, one of the one of the things that I did in this paper, Lakatel and Habib looked at relative clauses, and they presented a, a paper last year um, on this issue. But they were coming at it from the the Wix's LCD kind of the traditional model for understanding the sequences of the accents and what they mean. And what they found was that um, that uh, restricted restrictive well, relative clauses in general um, are are marked by a disjunctive that separates the head noun from its uh, relative clause. Which is not Both, what you would expect, right? You'd expect it for non-restrictive, but right. not necessarily for restrictive. Right, in, in yeah. kind of in a, yes. Um, although In a crude... In a crude way, yes. although that's without having any kind of determination of what the accents are doing or what they are. Like, is it mm. punctuation? Is it, is right, it an intonational? Right. Like, right. So they, they don't have that specificity in, in their model. But, but what they did find is that um, they're generally um, not able to be dis disambiguated. Um, but for restrictive relative clauses, restrictive rel relative clauses will... Um, that are conjoined to the, uh, where the head noun is conjoined to the relative clause with a conjunctive accent will be uh, restrictive. So if you have a relative clause where the head noun has a conjunctive accent and it's conjoined to the, rel the, the share relative clause, then it's restrictive. They found eight exceptions where the semantics were clearly non-restrictive. And, but what they did with their what they did with their model is is they said, well, this is an example of a place where you have uh, 
you have a conjunctive accent kind of for musical purposes, but mm. this is a virtual disjunctive and we can read it as a disjunctive. And, and so what I was trying to do with, with bringing in the, the cross-linguistic theory is to say, actually, first of all, if we know what this is and we can identify what the orthography is doing, how it relates to the, the features of prosodic phonology, we can actually identify the prosodic formats. And, uh, and then when we see an exception like this, we don't have to say substitution or what we like. We can we can say that this is actually it's OK. Yeah. Like there yeah. could be some other uh, and there probably are other constraints at work yeah. that that make the, that make uh, identifying the semantics of or disambiguating the semantics of this relative clause less important right. than maybe some of the other things that are going on. So all of that to say, um, Yes, I think, well, for, for this example, I mean, if you find a conjunctive uh, that's conjoining a head noun to a relative clause, it's probably a restrictive. restrictive. Um, but there are, there are exceptions, and, <laughs> and, and that's okay. That's, yeah. that's in line with kind of how language works. And, yeah. and so that's kind of, uh, the big takeaway for me is, I, as I continue to study uh, the accentual system, I, I see it, first of all, as a cohesive and a coherent orthography that just kind of blows blows me away because um, uh, you know modern linguists didn't try to uh, it, it took a thousand years after the Masoretes produced a prosodic orthography uh, that's what I'm calling a prosodic orthography right. for modern linguists to attempt this to, right. to begin transcribing and they um, have and all annotating. the technology to, exactly you know. exactly and so um, I think that's just pretty remarkable yeah. to to have that much care, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, and and yeah, to, to be able to to preserve that level of of structure for the language, um, and I think there's just so much yet to learn yeah. and to understand um, about what this system is doing um, in the text. And so, in so you're still traditions. hopeful that we can crack the code I, and I mean, figure listen, out. <laughs> I mean, it's it's. You know, there's so much to learn. I mean, yeah, just yeah. three, four days, a week of con conferences. I mean, every little thing is can be looked at in, in a million different ways. But, but yes, do we? Is there something that we can get out of um, learning to to read um, the, the the Masoretic orthography? Absolutely. Is it worthwhile? Absolutely. Is there a ton of work to be done? Um, to better understand it, absolutely. Do I have all the answers? Absolutely not. <laughs> but I feel like I do have a model that can help us begin to really start to understand it as a linguistic dimension of Tiberian Hebrew. That's great. Well, yeah. I'm very excited for you to continue that work and okay. tell me okay. all, all of your findings. <laughs> okay. Sounds so. good. Sounds good. Thank you so much for, for joining. Thanks, Kevin.